Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Moses' story is kind of cool. And just a really quick, a quick breakdown of Moses. He was born during one of the most dangerous times for a Hebrew male to be born in. His family was in captivity in Egypt. They were slaves there. And Egypt was one of the greatest nations on earth. It was flourishing. But it was flourishing because, you know, they had the Hebrews as slaves. And so in those times, the Pharaoh, which was the ruler of the land, had gotten scared of what the Hebrews were doing. And so he had decreed that every male born, because he was like, well, if we can stop, you know, the procreation, then we can stop the people, right? So no more guys, no more men to be born. This is going to stop right here. So this is how he had planned it to be. So Moses was born during this time that it was so dangerous. And, you know, women were afraid to give birth. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that it wasn't the greatest time to be living as a Hebrew person. So he's born and... His mom and his sister were very witty. They were very uh, resourceful. So as a mom, you know, his mom did whatever it was to keep him safe. So we know the story where she puts him in a basket and uh, she sings a song to him. As we saw the prince of Egypt, hush now, my baby. Um, I don't sing, sorry. But, you know, so she, she sends him away and he is saved. This is the grace of God that is keeping him alive. So he is found by oh my gosh, the princess of Egypt. He's found by Pharaoh's daughter and he's taken. And his sister, we all need sisters like this in our lives. She's like, hey, I know that you haven't had a kid. I know how biology works, right? And I know that you're going to need to feed him. We don't have Costco. We don't have formula that we can just go buy some. So let me tell you, there is a, I can show you, I can tell you where there's a nurse that will take care of him. So with her quick thinking, he is able to be raised by his own mom, even though he doesn't know that that's his mom. He's able to be raised by her. And, you know, I think, I don't know, I'm Mexican, so I think maybe, like, you know, she was kind of like a Mexican mom. She teaches him everything, you know, that, that she knows. She imparts into him everything that she knows about her God. And it doesn't say in the Bible, but I would love to think that she would tell him, you know, about the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the God who saved them, the God, you know, who was good, even though they're going through this terrible thing. Like, I would like to think that, you know, um, a lot, you know, a lot of there's maternal impacts in our lives that, you know, will tell us about the goodness. Like, you may be eating frijoles con tortillas, but life is good, okay, because <laughs> my tia said it, okay, because my mom said it. So Moses grows up with her, and he's actually with her for 12 years, so the most crucial, not only the first five, right? First five, one, two, three, four, five, teach the kids how to read. They learn all these things. <clears throat> Their character is developed by whoever is influencing them at that time, which is why parents, I encourage you, bring your kids, bring your youth, bring your neighbor's kids, because these are crucial times for them. 12 years old. At 12, in those times, you know, he's, he is now a young man. He goes into Pharaoh's house. He goes out into the world where he is now surrounded by other ideologies, theologies. Egypt, you know, at, at this time is a very um, self-centered type of place to grow up in. They themselves, you know, thought that they were gods. There's deities all around. It's the God of this and it's the God of that. It's the God of this. And so now he knows about the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. But he also knows about Anubis. He also knows about all these other gods that are going on. <clears throat> and Pharaoh himself thought he was a god. So he's <clears throat> learning all of these things from for 28 years, okay? Moses lived to be about 120 years. Uh, you know, I know that that's how many years we have been promised here on earth. Uh, some people, you know, you hear about, thank you, you hear about, you know, places in, in, in China, the Asian place. I'm like, what are they eating that they actually do get to live to that age, which is like what I'm believing for. I changed my eating habits because I want to, you know, live to be that long. But, you know, let's just put it into perspective. His childhood is raised up with God. His adolescence is surrounded. He's, he's out in the world. He's out being influenced by other things. And now let's talk about his adulthood, his mature years. He is a 
little bit confused. He's compulsive. He has some issues. Uh, he has some anger issues. I'm not looking at anyone. If you have some, you know, you know who you are. Uh, listen to the anger series that we just had. It's awesome. It's going to help you a lot and the people around you. But in his anger, he kills somebody because of the injustice that's going on. See, Moses, at this time, he had a lot of identity issues. He didn't know who he was. He knew that he had a connection with the Hebrews, but he didn't know exactly what that connection was because he didn't know the relationship to the woman that had raised him. He knew he was out of place because he knew, like, deep down in his heart, I, I know that he knew that what the Egyptians were doing was wrong. But he just didn't know how to verbalize it. He didn't know that because he was surrounded by it. He knew it was wrong. He saw what happened. He saw an injustice and he acted on that. And he committed a crime. He killed a person. So now, you know, he's singing Bohemian Rhapsody. Mama, I just killed a man. I don't know if he's saying that. but So he goes off into the wilderness. He runs away because now... I don't know about you, but we get to a place that if you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you belong, you're just going to start wandering. So he went to the desert for 40 years for his mature, you know, a lot, what they were saying, childhood and then adolescence. So now his adulthood, he's lost. He's, one, he's wandering around. He becomes a shepherd, you know, makes a connection with the sheep. He can't talk to people. He gets married. You know, he has, he has children. But... He knows about a God. He knows about, you know, the gods of Egypt and all of that. And now he just doesn't know who he is. And this is where my favorite part of the story is that God comes to him. And he comes to him in such a way that he will pay attention. We all know the story, right? There's a burning bush. You know, it's on fire. But it doesn't consume. And he, that gets his attention. And I'm pretty sure that he had seen other things. You know, being in the court of Pharaoh, as you see forward, uh, we had a great representation of that at the Ten Plagues, his last family thrill night. That was awesome. But he had seen magic being performed. He had seen all of that. But so it had to be something that captured his attention. I don't know about you, but for me, there has been a lot of things that God has done to capture my attention. When I come here, sometimes, you know, for him, I, I think, I would like to think that it was kind of like in a place where, I don't know if you've been there, but we're just like, I don't know what else to do, God. And sometimes you don't even know that you're talking to God. You're just talking to you all and say, I don't know what else to do. And so God comes at that point. What I imagine to be a low point in your life, you grow up knowing about God. You grow up being groomed to be a prince of Egypt. And now you're nobody like in the middle of the desert looking at, like you're talking to sheep. Like those are your friends, the sheep. So you're at this point, And so then this is when God comes. And God has to, he has to kind of, he has to get his attention. And the way that he does it is first he introduces himself. Okay, he calls him out. So I don't know about you, but have you guys ever like, you know, just been chilling at home, you know, or whatever, you're doing something. You get a message it, and the message is like, hey, you know, person for me, like, hey, girl, you know, I just want to see how you've been doing. I hope you've been doing great. But like you don't recognize the number and you're like, okay, who is this? Okay. They know information about me. Like I think that I know who you are, but I don't know who you are. So you don't want to be rude, right? So you don't want to be like, okay, oh my gosh, like this is a friend that like, I gave a number to and like I didn't even save it. I've done that before. Like I haven't saved your number. Like I talk to you every day at church, but I haven't saved your number. I'm so sorry. And I have done that before. Um, so you're kind of like try to politely like try to get information to kind of like, okay, see if you can get some like info, like become, you know, um, uh, homes and like, you know, see, okay, if I, if I know this about them, like, and I know, I know this about them, then I'll probably know who it is. So I won't be embarrassed that I don't know who you are. But the question that you want to ask is, who are you, right? Who is this? Who is this that knows things about me? He calls him by name. So now, like, he's got his attention. So who are you? So um, God, oh, before that, um, Moses says, here I am. It's the very first thing that when God is getting our attention, first you have to acknowledge and make yourself known, okay, God, here I am. Uh, he's been living with this crime that he ran away with. You know, I don't know what the statute of limitations was for murder back in Egypt, but I don't know, you know, um, maybe it hadn't expired yet. But he said in Exodus 3, 6, he says, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. So the first thing that God will do to us is he will present himself, he will introduce himself in a way that we're familiar with. 
So he is going to say, when he calls us, we're in that moment, he is going to say, you know, Jessica, I am the God of the friend that people have been talking about. You see that person that God has been doing all of these amazing things for? You see that person that always talks about that? That's me. That's who I am. I am that God. And then, then he'll give you the assignments. Then he'll tell you, okay, this is what you're going to do. Because after he tells him, and read the story, it's really awesome. Um, you know, he, he goes on to, to tell him, like, this is what you're going to do. He talks about, you know, I have heard my people. Like, this is what I'm calling you to do. And then comes a moment where we question ourselves. Moses says to God in verse 11, but Moses spoke to God. See, God isn't just going to come and say, yo, you know, uh, Richard, this is what you're going to do. No, he has a conversation with us. Because in that conversation, we get to know, we get to be reminded if we don't know or if we already knew. We get to be reminded of who God is. He tells him, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And this right here resonates so much with me because what he's saying is that who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? We, if you remember, he grew up in Pharaoh. He's his grandson technically. If everybody in the family died, if every male in the family died, he was going to be Pharaoh. He has a connection to him. But he's saying my identity has been messed up. I don't know who I am. Who am I? I can't go talk to Pharaoh. I don't know my connection with the Israelites. You know, he was, felt out of place. And this is why I resonate with him because, you know, for me it's like, I am the child of immigrants. I am an uneducated, I didn't finish college, God. I didn't finish it. I started it. I love education. I promote education. I will tell your kids to go to school. But guess what? Jessica doesn't have a college degree. And for me, you know, like I'm, some, you know, sometimes we, we, we think about that stuff. So then, you know, he says, who am I? And the thing that I want to focus on, and I don't want to cut into your time, but God says, I am who I am. And when he speaks to him about that, I love that he uses I am as a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing, right? He uses it as a noun, and he says, I am. See, we're used to I am being like a verb. I am sitting down. And verb is an action, right? A, a, a verb is something that we do. God is not going to become something in your life. God is not going to become your savior. He's not going to become your rock. He's not going to become your provider. He is your provider. He already was, he is, and he will always be. And that's the great I am in your life. And so in order for us to understand who, who we are in our lives, because Moses questioned that, he questioned his identity. I question my identity every day. Who am I to be a mom? Who am I to be, you know, teaching kids? Who am I to be speaking into your life? No, I need to know who God is in my life. And the times that I have gone away from that are the times that I have cried out and said, God, I'm not good enough. I recently had a moment, I was just sharing with somebody, like, I recently had a moment that I was like, mm, no. But God was like, no, this is, and so I needed to remind myself of who God is in my life. And I want to just leave this with you. 2 Peter 1.3. God's power has given us everything we need to lead a godly life. He has given us everything that we need to lead a godly life. See, we're not good on our own, and that's okay. Like, we need to come to those terms. Moses wasn't good on his own, but when God came into his life then, that's when everything became awesome. All of this has come because we know. Everybody say, we know. See, we have to know him. And you're already doing something by being here, by reading your Bible. Like, that's how we get to know God. Uh, because we know the God who chose us. He chose us because of his. Everybody say, his. It's all about his glory, his own glory and goodness. So I want to just leave you with that, that, you know, I, I actually wrote out and I wanted to show you. I had, I had to, like, remind myself of all the I am's of God. I am. I am who I am. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I am from above. I'm God Almighty. I am he who comforts you. I am holy. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the word. I am the bread of life. I am the Lord and there is no other. So all of the I am's, Google them. Just look them up and remind yourself of that. And one last thing is if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, maybe I haven't had a Moses moment. Well, good for you. That's awesome. Um, if you hadn't had a moment like that, then I want to challenge you with 
then let's go ahead and let's be that somebody in somebody else's life to remind them of this is the God of Jessica, who Jessica is not perfect, but the God of Jessica is pretty awesome. Amen? All right. So good. That was awesome. I love it. The God of that person you know that has seen one victory after another, the God of the person you know who has overcome that challenge that seemed to keep them back from, from really feeling free, that's the God who encourages us. That's the God who, who keeps us going when we have no strength to go. It's thinking of, see, we, we may have our own experiences, and sometimes our own experiences don't measure up to what we like them to be. So then we have this perception of a God who doesn't measure to our experiences. But sometimes you need to take yourself out of your own feeling and look at the God of the experiences of those around you. And that's why it's so important and so important to build relationships, godly relationships within the body of Christ. Because you never know when you need someone else's story to create hope for yours. You're never going to know when you need someone else's victory to pave the way for your breakthrough. You never know. You're going to need to rely on someone else's new umph, right, new, new strength to give you hope that, you know what, my God who rescued you, that's my God. The God who saved you, that's my God. And you're going to need that to, to pull you through as Moses did. Uh, Moses needed to know that, that, yeah, he may have not felt like um, a Hebrew at the time, but the God of his people was with him. Amen. Uh, let's do this. Go to Matthew chapter 18 as we continue on. And I want to, um, I want to, to really describe to you the heart that God has for the one who is willing, the, the heart and desire that God has for the person who says, you know what, God, I think I'm ready to do more with my life. I think I'm ready to do more with what you've given me. Because the, the disciples, when they followed Jesus, they all wanted to do more. But I don't quite think they understood what more looked like. I think they all wanted more. They all desired more. But they weren't ready to experience what that looked like. They weren't in a position to make that kind of decision just yet until Jesus painted the picture for them. With several parables. And this is one that he used in Matthew chapter 18. And he says this. He says, about that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Come on, Jesus. Who's the goat here? Who is the Kobe Bryant of heaven? Who is the Michael Jordan? I need to know. We need to know. Tell us who is the greatest of all time. Because if they're the greatest of all time, then we need to know what they're doing so we can become that, right? That, that was their intention. What, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? How can we get there? So Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them, right? So he, he brings this little child up and he, he makes this child the center of attention. And then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child here is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest. You know, being a, a uh, father to two young girls, I've, uh, I've quickly learned, quickly, that kids know exactly what they want. They, they might not know what's best for them. But they know exactly what they want. There is no hesitation. There is no make change in their mind. You'll have a rare opportunity to convince them otherwise, but it better be better than what they want. It better be better, bigger, cooler than what they have their heart set on. Because best believe, when they know what they want, they will do anything to get it. Anything. I, I, was, uh, I was taking a walk with uh, my, both of my daughters, Aria and Sela, And Aria is four and Sela is almost two. And we're taking a walk, and we're just going, and uh, Aria was just kind of just talking about just everything that she's had in school and all this cool stuff. And so then comes the Christmas conversation where she now realizes that she is a daughter and I am her dad. Therefore, I have a duty to provide a special gift for this girl. So she starts asking, so what are you going to get me and all of this stuff? And we're just talking. 
And I'm trying to divert to the story of Christmas and uh, get her attention on Jesus. No, just kidding. So we're, we're, we're walking and I'm talking to her. And, uh, and, and I'm like, well, what, what do you want? I, I don't, you know, what do you want for Christmas? She's telling me. She's like, oh, I want a baby alive. And, and I want this. And, you know, it poops and you feed it and you do all this stuff. And I want that. And, and then she's like, oh, I want a guitar and this, this, and that. And I want a Elena of Avalor guitar. And I want not an electric but an acoustic, like very specific. She knows what she wants, right? She was so clear, like, I want this. I'm like, okay, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. We can make that happen. I think we can make that happen, uh, but here's what we're going to have to do to make that happen, okay? So now daddy has a list. You know, daughter has a list and a daddy has a list. This is, this is what we have to do. So we're going to, I'm going to need you to, to help out, um, be a helper around the house. Do you know what that looks like? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what it looks like. Okay, so this is what I'm going to need you to do. And I start spelling it out to her. This is what, these are what things you're going to have to do for you to, to get to a place of earning this. Because I, I want to teach her value. I want to teach her that. That, that this means something to me, right? That this gift means something to me. So I'm, I'm teaching her, I'm telling her all these things, and, and we get home, and she wastes no time, no time. As soon as she steps in the door, takes off her jacket, grabs a hanger, and I had told her specifically, I said, hey, you need, you, this is what you need to tell me. I need you to put all your clothes in your hamper, and as soon as it gets full, you need to say, all right, Dad, my hamper's full. So that way we know, okay, it's time to wash clothes and all that. Wastes no time, goes right in. Yells from the other room, Dad, my hamper's full. Takes off her shoes, puts her shoes away. She even goes and takes off Sailor's shoes, puts her shoes away. All right, and it doesn't stop there. This is just at night, right? Brushes her teeth, gets all ready, just ready to go. Laying down, like she's like, okay, I'm in. I want my baby alive. And then, and then here comes the next morning. And I'm thinking, like, you know, you think with a four-year-old's attention, like that, thing, that, that whole, like, imaginary dream you have of everything going well is going to end the next morning. Because they're a kid, right? They have other things to do. So, so here she comes in the morning, and I make her breakfast, her famous oatmeal she loves. And we make it, and, it's, and she's eating her oatmeal, and then her sister's eating oatmeal. And here she goes. She's like, Sayla, why don't you put your bowl in mine, and I'll take it to the sink. And after I take it to the sink, I'll come wipe down the table. And then she does it, and she takes it, and she brings it to the sink. And she goes ahead and she actually wipes down the table. And I'm just thinking, like, oh, I got two weeks of this. I'm going to milk everything I can do for two weeks or <laughs> doing every little thing. I'm like, okay, Aria, we're going to have some fun. You thought you were having fun. We we're going to have some fun. So, so she, she, she's, she literally, she saw what she wanted. She had the conversation. She heard from her dad what needed to be done. And she was like, man, I want that. I will do whatever I got to do to do that. And so she, she positioned herself in this willingness to like, man, and, and believe me, p- picking up her sister's bowl is not something she desires naturally. Okay, there was, there was a price tag on that. And so, so she's like, okay, she's doing these things. And I'm thinking like all it took was some motivation and a heart's desire. And so I believe that Jesus didn't use the child to embarrass his disciples. I don't think that at all. I don't, because Jesus loved his disciples. Man, they were friends to him. He wanted to inspire them. He wanted to encourage them. So I don't think he used the child to say, man, you guys better step up because this child is, is, is greater than you. No, I think he was using the child to really have them examine, what do you want? Why are you really following me? What is your desire? And you, and you throw out this word, the greatest, but do you understand what the greatest looks like? And the child symbolized what greatness looked like. And that greatness was that this child had a sense of humility. And, and humility, when you look at the word humility, and, and it has different synonyms, it's different words. It, another word for humility is servility, which is basically the excessive willingness to serve others. Excessive, beyond the top, over and above, more than you ever would have naturally enjoyed to, but beyond kind of willingness to serve others. And so you want to embody greatness in the kingdom of heaven. You want to embody greatness at your job. You want to become great in your home, amongst your, your, your family. You want to be known as a, a, a great legacy lever, someone who, who, who leaves a legacy of greatness for their family. Uh, it starts with an excessive willingness to serve others. So this child embodied that. 
because uh, he knew that this child, uh, this child knew exactly what they wanted and knew that they would see it through to whatever they needed to do to get what they wanted. And so I, I don't think people will ever get to see God in your life as that great I am that he says he is. They'll never see that until you position to yourself to a place of humility to say, God, here I am. Here I am. They, why? Because who, who do they identify greatness to? To your accomplishments or to what now God is able to accomplish because of your willingness? See, now people have an image of God. No one has seen God, but when they see you and they see, man, this, this person is, is, is excelling in their intelligence, excelling in their maturity. This is like at a supernatural rate. They're faced with one challenge, but yet they have the strength to push through another and then that's when you now have a position to say, here I am, God. There's a people that needs to know how great you really are. There's a people that, that can't call you the great I am because they haven't tasted the great I am. But because I've tasted it and it's pretty good, I'm willing for others to see how good it tastes for them to know, God, you are the great I am. Uh, this, this reminds me of Isaiah um, as I'm wrapping this all up. Uh, Isaiah uh, you know, Isaiah was an insecure individual. Isaiah was, was lacking confidence for no, no, nothing that, that was wrong. Isaiah wasn't lacking confidence for anything that was wrong. Isaiah wasn't, wasn't this um, embarrassment to mankind. Not at all. He, he, he was simply a man who was in an environment and a culture of sin. Point blank period. He, he had been around this environment for so long that this is what he knew to do. This was his behavior. These were his customs as a man influenced by his environment. So Isaiah, Isaiah has this, this vision, right? He, he sees this beautiful vision and, and he sees a, a, a powerful beings and heavenly beings. And, and he hears the voice of God and he hears God specifically say, man, whom can we send? And, and so Isaiah at, at this moment, man, he, initially he is, he is freaked out because he's in the presence of, the, of God. He's in the presence of these heavenly beings. And he is a man who has sinned, who has fallen short, who spoke ill. He, the Bible says, he even says out of his own lips, I had filthy lips. And I, not only do I have filthy lips, but I dwell among a people that have filthy lips. Man, who, who am I that I am to even see what this greatness looks like? To see the greatness of heaven. Who am I? Who am I to have that privilege of seeing that? And so the, the angels come down and they, they, they begin to purge him. And I love it because, you see, Isaiah simply acknowledged the biblical law that when you confess your sins to God, that he is faithful and just to forgive them. And Isaiah, Isaiah, he, he expressed his sin. He confessed to God, I have unclean lips, God. I have unclean lips. I live, I'm, I hang around in an environment of just unclean, just, just wrong things. And here God comes and, and, and cleanses him and sends his angels to cleanse him. And, and, and here he is in this place of gratefulness now, a place of thankfulness. And so he's in a place of gratefulness and God has something that needs to be done. He needs a man, he needs a person to go out and to share a message of hope, share a message of repentance to his people for they would turn around and, and come back home. And, and, and so here Isaiah is and, and Isaiah now because of his gratefulness, because of his thankfulness, Isaiah now desires for whatever God wants done to be done. He, he now becomes like a child in the sense that his humility is, God, man, if this is what you want, then why should you have to look any further? Right? Why should you have to go to and fro to find someone to represent you? Here I am. That man, God, look no further. And, and, and I love it because at that moment, when, when all the other thoughts that, that were going on in his head that goes on in many of our heads, right? The idea that, man, what lies ahead of you is, is far bigger than your ability inside of you, right? The, the, the feelings that I'm not good enough, the, the moments where you feel like your past is preventing you from walking into your future. Isaiah had those. He had those. He had those. But he humbled himself like a child. 
he humbled himself and his excessive willingness to serve others consumed him to the point of saying, God, here I am. And because of his ability to say, God, here I am, now the people of Israel got to experience the great I am. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Isaiah walked around with a confidence like never before. And for the rest of his days, continued in a confidence that came from God. A confidence that allowed him to accomplish the God mission placed on his life. But not just that. But then you experience a nation who repents and turns around and comes to God. And, and Isaiah was on the forefront. Because he had a desire. Because he was willing. And because he understood that his great I am was with him and gave him the strength to do that. Isaiah had a, had a union with God. His, his, his ability to humble himself brought him into such a close relationship with God. Your ability to, to humble yourself, even when you, you feel like you're not able, I'm telling you, that's when you draw even closer to God. That moment when you feel like, ah, I haven't been taught in this area, I... I I, I, I haven't encountered a challenge like this before. The moment you can say, God, I've, I messed up. I, I bit off more than I can chew. And I, I made a promise that I don't think I can fulfill. And, and you, you, get, you get a little real with God. And you humble yourself to that, to that point of that. God is now able to draw close. Why? Because you're deciding to draw close to him. Because you recognize and you acknowledge that your strength isn't enough to do what you need to do at that moment. And as the Bible tells us that when we draw close to him, he draws close to us. So now you enter into an intimate union. Isaiah entered into an intimate union with God. And I love, this is, this is what the Bible tells us about this, this intimacy and this union with God. It says this in 1 John 4, 17. In this union and fellowship with him, love is completed and perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. See, Isaiah had a little bit of umph now, a little bit more confidence because of this union with him. So we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Some of the, the, the biggest excuses or reasons or whatever you want to call it, I, I have experienced and heard from a lot of my friends or a lot of people that I know that just uh, are hesitant to come to God. It's like, man, I, I just, uh, I got to work on me because I don't have that boldness to come as I am here now. I, I need to work on me a little bit. I need to get myself together. But it, it's, it's funny how the Bible tells us that it's the relationship that brings about the boldness. It's the relationship that brings about the correction. It's the relationship, it's the fellowship that completes the love necessary to fix those things that you feel like you need to fix first. It's the union. It's the closeness. And, and that doesn't just apply to someone who doesn't, who, who doesn't know God. Or This applies to the person who knows God very well. This applies, you see, the union is only as strong as you make time for it to be. The union doesn't get strong because of each year that goes by, you knowing God. That union can weaken when you decide to pull back and kind of let it do its own thing. Isaiah was able to do what he needed to do because he daily, daily strengthened this union, this fellowship. Why? Because he needed the love of God to complete the assignment before him. And that's only possible through this relationship, through this union that he has with him. And I love, I love the rest of this verse. It's because as he is, so are we in this world. As I was mentioning earlier, people will only know how great God is when you humble yourself to position of willingness. And when you come to a place of realizing that because of who he is, I am to be in this world. When you come to a place of my, my obligation, man, my duty, my desire, my desire is that in this world, they will see the great I am because of who I am. They will know his greatness because of who I am. 
And, I, and don't, don't, don't get it twisted. That's not a, a, a statement of, 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 of conceit or a, a statement of self uh, puffiness, uh, for lack of a better word. It's a statement of humility because you recognize that God depends on you. He depends on you for people to taste and see. He depended on Jesus. He depended on Jesus as a man who walked the earth. He depended on Jesus in order for you and I today to recognize there is a God. And he's here to save us. And he said, God, if you can make this cup pass, please make it pass. But because I'm willing, nevertheless, let your will be done. And even Jesus had to come to a place of humility, of servility, and excessive willingness to serve others in order for you and I to stand here today with the assurance of an eternal life in heaven. With the assurance of a guaranteed future worshiping our living God. Guaranteed. And with Christmas here around the corner, days away, there's people who don't have the confidence of a guarantee of that future. And you and I are around them every day. You and I are seeing them every day. You and I will see them for some of us when we get home tonight. And you'll look them in the eye. And you standing to look them in the eye will have confidence of your future, but they won't have the same. But they can. And that takes a willingness to say, God, use me. Here I am. Send me. The Bible says that, that, and Paul says that it, it's not I who is qualified, but it's he who qualifies me. And there's not one person in this room who needs to worry about a special qualification. You know what qualified you? The blood of Jesus. The sacrifice that was not, that was not easy, but was willing to be made because of your life. That qualified you. And you received it. And you welcomed it. And so I just want to leave you with that tonight as we, as we go on and listen. We're days away from Christmas. You, some of you, you already have your plans made out. Uh, you already have your Christmas plans laid out. You already have your, your service that you're going to attend uh, mapped out already. Some of you have already invited people. But I want to remind you, listen, there is still a, a, great, a great load of people that don't have the confidence of the great I am. They don't have an understanding of who God really says he is. And, and I promise you, you have what it takes for them to encounter that. I promise you that. If Isaiah did, you do. You have the ability to bring people to a place of awe because of the greatness of God. All it takes, all it takes for you to walk out these doors and say, God, look no further. Here I am. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.